Hello everybody and welcome. Today I have another AMD X570 motherboard to take a look at with you. This one is an ASUS ROG Strix X570e. So why did I get another X570 motherboard? Well, there was nothing inherently wrong with the ASUS Tough X570 Plus gaming motherboard that's already in my rig right now. However, what I found out when I put my uh, SanDisk SX300 6.4 terabyte PCIe SSD in there is that the second uh, by 16 physical PCIe slot on that motherboard didn't have enough PCIe lanes to run that SSD at full speed. It only had four electrical lanes even though it was a by 16 physical size slot and my SSD wants eight electrical lanes. This Strix X570e gaming board will give me eight PCIe electrical lanes for both of the two top PCIe by 16 slots. So I should be able to run my SSD at full speed. So with that said, let's take a look and see what's inside. So first popping open the lid, we have the motherboard and its upper tray and anti-static bag. And then we have this cardboard box over here, uh, which contains the Wi-Fi antennas for the Intel AX200 AX Wi-Fi card integrated onto the board. Now the back of the antenna itself is magnetized so you can just pop it onto uh, the side of your case or ASUS also includes this little base right here if you decide to put it somewhere else that you can kind of pop the antenna into like that. Beneath the motherboard we have the manual along with uh, driver and software CD um, and the coupon for a cable mod if you need uh, cable accessories. And then there's a bunch of uh, ROG stickers uh, as well. Um, underneath the left and right compartments, we have more accessories. So on the left here, we have some uh, cables, or sorry, extension cables for uh, RGB lighting. We have four SATA cables. Um, two of them end in right angles. The others are all just straight. Um, you have a, a funny little uh, door hanger for do not disturb while gaming. We have some zip ties, some standoffs for the M.2 slots, and we have a uh, thermistor so you can place it somewhere and uh, get a temperature reading. So if you wanted to do your you know, case airflow temps, you could just stick this dangling in your case, or if you wanted to see the backside of the motherboard, I guess you could put this over there. Looking at the motherboard overall, we have a pretty drab black and gray color scheme which is probably why everyone's like, oh my God, we need all this RGB madness to add a little bit more color back into our lives. And we can see some pretty large shrouds in the IO area and also in the chipset area covering uh, a lot of the board. Looking at the CPU area, it's a fairly standard affair, right? We have our CPU sockets, our AM4 heatsink mounting brackets, which I'll be taking off because I'm using a water block. Um, we have our CPU uh, fan header over here, an SPI TPM module uh, header. And uh, interestingly enough, I noticed that ASUS is putting um, at the bottom over here uh, stickers for the board revision and what BIOS it comes with. So mine is coming with BIOS 1404 and currently the latest released one is 1407. So I will probably go ahead and upgrade that. Um, one funny thing is if you look at these uh, VRM heat sinks, why does this shroud why, why does this shroud have to extend over the heatsink? Like it's blocking a bunch of airflow. And if you look at the uh, backside of that heatsink under the shroud, you can see that there are much fewer uh, levels of fins than there are on the front side. So the front side actually looks like, oh yeah, I'm supposed to actually dissipate some heat. So I'm gonna increase surface area over there. Whereas the backside is, yeah, we didn't add as much surface area because we're blocking a lot of airflow with this silly shroud. Additionally, uh, you'll notice that both of these heat sinks are connected with a heat pipe and nestled right behind that heat pipe we have our CPU uh, power connectors. Now this board comes with a 6 plus 2 phase VRM which is two more phases than the uh, tough X570 plus gaming has. Um, so if I really cared about trying to max out my overclocks this would be better. So we'll see if I actually take advantage of that sometime or not though. Looking at the memory slot area, we have four slots for four DIMMs and uh, over here ASUS has a little label with stars showing you where they would like you to install the DIMMs first. So if you're only using one DIMM, install it in DIMM A2, which is the furthest away from the CPU. If you're using two DIMMs, then install them in A2 and B2, which from the bottom are the first 
and thirds slots going up and then obviously if you have all four then populate all four. Over on the right side we have three cooling component headers. Uh, two of them are for CPU fan so you have CPU fan primary and then an optional CPU fan header and then the third one is labeled uh, AIO pump and that's if you're using an all-in-one uh, water cooling uh, CPU block radiator unit and um, these headers are rated for one amp so that's 12 watts total and the CPU ones are controlled by QFAN um, to control the uh, fan speed but the AIO one always runs full speed. We also have two RGB headers over on the right side and uh, next to the second one we have four diagnostic LEDs to see uh, what the system is doing during boot up. And then we have our ATX24 main connector and a ACE USB 3.2 Gen 2 header. Over on the lower left side of the board we have eight SATA ports and uh, the manual says that any of those can be used to create a RAID 0, 1, or 10 uh, configuration through the chipset. And awesomely, none of these SATA ports get disabled if you populate both M.2 SSD slots on the board, or any of the PCIe slots to, for that matter. We also have our system panel headers, a couple more RGB headers, and three more cooling component headers. Now two of them are for fans which uh, also have a max output of 1 amp or 12 watts total um, but one of them is labeled water pump and this one just like the AIO header over by the CPU um, is not throttled by QFAN and instead runs full output but unlike the AIO header this one can do a maximum of 3 amps or 36 watts total. So if you're running a custom water loop, you may want to plug right into that and use it to monitor your pump speeds. Also, funny enough, there's a little ROG tag attached to the shroud over the chipset fan, and uh, I, I almost wonder if that's a little like pull tab you're supposed to use after you unscrew the uh, shroud to take it off. Working our way up, we have the USB 3.2 Gen 1 chassis uh, panel connector, a couple headers for USB 2, header for our temperature sensor for the thermistor that was included in the packaging, a node header, the postcode display, and our front panel audio header. Above that we have the audio section of the board with ASUS's Supreme FX branded audio solution. Looking at the PCIe 4.0 slots, which we have five of, three of them are by 16 in physical size and the other two are uh, by one size. The two topmost ones with the metal reinforcement, those can run at high 8 speeds on both of them if you have both populated. If you just have, you know, just the primary one closest to the CPU populated, it will run at the full 16x. Um, but if you're using uh, anything else in that second slot, both of them will run at uh, 8x, which really shouldn't be an issue. The leftmost PCIe by 16 slot only runs at 4x and the 1x slot next to it will air bandwidth with that slot. In order to access the M.2 slots, we'll first have to remove the plastic shroud covering the X570 chipset fan. There are two screws that we'll use a Phillips number one to remove. Once the screws are out, we can use our handy dandy ROG pull tab and remove the fan shroud. And uh, beneath that right, we can clearly see the X570 chipset fan, and then we also have four screws, two on each heatsink to access the M.2 slots. One other thing that's interesting is there's a hole through one of the heatsinks uh, so that you can secure the motherboard to the case with a screw there. So I guess uh, we have to remove this shroud anyways when we're installing the motherboard, unless we opt not to use that screw. Additionally, there's this uh, plastic piece in the middle and uh, I wasn't sure what it was covering at first, but on further inspection, it looks like this is an LED module for more uh, RGB amazingness. So now we can use our Phillips number one screwdriver again and loosen all four screws on the M.2 heatsinks. And those screws are captured so they won't come out all the way. And then we can go ahead and take them off. And uh, obviously, if you look on the bottom, you can see there's a uh, thermal pad for your M.2 uh, drives that you might put on there. Another thing about the ROG Strix X570E's heatsinks is that they won't physically fit in uh, each other's spot. So you can see here I'm lining up the upper heatsink with the lower one and the screw holes don't align with the mounts. So you can't accidentally mix these up. Now we can finally see our M.2 slots and each one of these can run uh, SATA, SATA M.2 
or PCIe M.2. And uh, if you run PCIe, each of these has four lanes dedicated to it. You can see that there are multiple uh, standoff points um, for putting the standoffs that were included in the accessories. And each one of these slots can accommodate a 2260, 2280, or 22110 length SSD. One of the really annoying things about having this plastic fan shroud cover one of the screws on each of the M.2 heatsinks is if you have a GPU that overhangs this fan shroud, which you most likely will, it means you have to move the GPU to remove the fan shroud so that you can remove the M.2 drive or even install an M.2 drive. This contrasts with the X570 Tough gaming motherboard that I already have where I don't have to remove any fan shrouds or my GPU if I want to install or remove any of the M.2 drives. So I guess as you spend more money, form tends to follow function instead of the opposite way around. Taking a look at the backside of the motherboard, there's really nothing remarkable here. You've got some, uh, woo, go ROG team uh, wording, you know, the name of the board itself, your standard uh, AM4 backplate, but there's nothing like any, you know, uh, additional bracing or heat sink, stiffening plates that uh, some other motherboards might have. But then again, at this price point, hmm, not necessarily expecting that. Lastly, we have our back panel. Starting from the left, we have our display port and HDMI 2.0 port. Um, although I'm not too sure how many people are really going to be using uh, onboard graphics with a quote unquote gaming board. And then we have a BIOS flashback or a BIOS flash button along with uh, a multitude 7 uh, USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports. So all of the USB ports back here are 3.2 Gen 2. And uh, there's also one type C connector as well. We have two of our Ethernet ports, uh, the Realtek 2.5 gig LAN and the Intel Gigabit LAN. We have two connectors for our Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5.0 antennas. And then we have all of the audio connections. Since this is considered a slightly higher end board, it also has an integrated IO shield. So there's no need to pop a new one in um, when installing this board. So that is a quick look at the ASUS ROG Strix X570E motherboard. I'm looking forward to swapping this into my rig and seeing if I can unlock that extra bandwidth to my PCIe SSD perform at its max potential. Now I know some people are going to say, oh, you should have just got the Crosshair 8 Hero. But to be quite honest, I'd be spending more money for features that I'm not really going to use. The VRMs on this board are already plenty capable for any overclocking that I might be doing. And I'm really not going to be doing anything extreme like, you know, liquid nitrogen. And furthermore, if I wanted to get Wi-Fi, then I would be spending considerably more. The regular Crosshair 8 Hero is maybe about $30 to $40 more than the Strix X570e. But if I wanted the Wi-Fi version, then it was more like $80 more than this board. And considering I got this board, slight bit on sale, so less than $300, I'm pretty happy.